Hello and welcome back everybody to episode 225 of the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. I'm Dan John. And each and every week I sit down and I answer your questions. So this is kind of a question and answer podcast. And, and I and I like that format. Um, like, I really don't have much, that much else to say, I guess. But so listen, if you have a question, send it to podcast at DanJohnUniversity.com. Um, I love getting the questions. It, uh, I really like it too. When I see someone follow up and said, thanks for answering my question. That, that means a lot to me. So let's keep doing it. And remember, um, if you have follow-ups, let us know. Okay. And, and I'm more than honored to get back with you. I ask a lot of people to get back with me on these questions. It doesn't happen very often, but when it does, I really appreciate those follow-ups too. Thank you. We're going to start off with a question from Mick. Mick says this. I really don't have a question, Mick, that makes it difficult for a podcast based on questions and answers. But some really positive feedback from the 10,000 Kettlebell Swing program. I completed eight s- sessions with a 28 kilo bell. That's a good effort, man. And each workout got progressively better with faster times and less rest required. I'd like to add in some shadow boxing or heavy bag work to my training, and I have already found a huge difference from the kettlebell work. For example, on the heavy bag, four rounds would be pretty hard. After the eight kettlebell sessions, I was able to do five rounds much more easily and had a few more in the tank. Also, I tried a kettlebell mile walk with 10K on each side for the first time in over a year, and it felt pretty easy. That's, uh, that's pretty good. Therefore, in two weeks, I have noticeably improved conditioning and grip strength. That's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I want to talk about that, but let me finish this question. I have also recently got the Easy Strength for Fat Loss ebook, and looking forward to getting it started. I just need the big yellow Ulster or Ireland flag for my garage. (laughs) That's great. Yeah, so my mom's family is from uh, the north. That's why that's up there, and people... um, when I, when I go to Ireland, people often give me banners and flags and well, t-shirts and jackets and sweatshirts and everything else. So yeah, Nick, and, 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 and gentle listeners, there's something I, I want to talk about here and I like. One of the things about a lot of my programs is, is that, you know, I, I know a lot of people, I get questions about their programs. The end all of a lot of people's lives is the weight room. It's not mine. I mean, I love weightlifting. I love hanging out in the weight room. Uh, if I'm bored, I'll read a weightlifting magazine or, or a book that I've read 50 times and, and I love it. Okay, I get, I love this stuff. I do. But there's more to life than, uh, I don't know, swinging a kettlebell or, uh, you know, cleaning jerks or whatever it is. So I, I appreciate this because one of the things I want you to do, uh, if, if, if you're following the workouts I give you, is I want the other aspects of your life to be better. Like, for me, you know, when I shovel snow, and I and there's a lot of that here in Utah, you know, I, I feel like all that weightlifting carries over to my snow shoveling. And all that, uh, you know, kettlebell work helps me when I rake the lawn. All that helps me pick up my grandchildren. It, uh, it, all, it helps me pick up my daughter, I, uh, daughters. Uh, I mentioned this in my Thanksgiving message that uh, every year I, I pick up my daughters. Every year I pick up my daughters sometime between Thanksgiving and New Year's, just once. So that, I heard this one time years ago, you you always remember the first time you pick up your child, but you never know when it's your last. So every year I pick up my child. And so I can tell you the last time I picked up my daughter. And it's kind of just a thing. But I'm proud of the fact that I can, you know, I'm 66 and my daughter's in their thirties and I still can pick them up uh, once a year. And, and it means a lot to me. Um, I, I kind of wish, in a sense, Mick, that we could we could start a whole thing about this. Is that, like, for example, with the 10K challenge, and I think most people notice that, their weird overall, whatever you want to call it, uh, I hate using those letters, but when I was young, we called it general training. But your, your life is better. You know, if you have to take the garbage out, uh, before you did the 10,000 swing challenge, you might have been shuffling along after, you know, you, you whip the garbage cans and you, you jaunt down to the sidewalk. Um, you know, when you're carrying luggage 
before the 10,000 swing challenge. You were uh, after you proudly carried your whole family's luggage. I don't know. Um, with programs like the th uh, transformation program, I was always, my, my athletes would tell me, and interesting, their parents would tell me, I don't know what you guys are doing in the weight room, but you know, Billy or Susie, they just look so much better. The transformation program, and it's, it's another tiny, short, boom, 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 in and out, you're done program. And yet after two weeks, four weeks, six weeks of it, people look better overall. Now, again, all programs kind of have a, you know, there's an expiration date, 10,000 swing challenge, 10,000 in one swing, you're done. You don't need more swings. Transformation program is about six weeks. Uh, when we did the body as one piece, we just noticed that we just got weirdly strong. Um, I mentioned one time, one of my books or articles about, I was at a place in life where I couldn't walk up a flight of stairs, but I could pick up a flight of stairs, which I thought was funny. So it's nice to hear this, uh, that you're seeing the transitions happening. Um, if any of the other listeners would want to send in, uh, if you've done any of the programs we've done, you want to just comment on it because it would be nice for me personally to be able to start compiling like, okay, for this kind of life stuff, the 10,000 swing challenge for that kind of, for this, maybe the transformation program. Uh, it's funny. Uh, I'm actually kind of fired up. Maybe I, Maybe I'll start popping in the transformation program. The transformation program, three sets of eight, two exercises, three days a week. It's not very much, but the movements are tough. Uh, it's, a, it's a great Christmas work, uh, Christmas, uh, winter workout. So thank you. Uh, that was really fun. That was a really a fun start. So let's keep going. Uh, we have a question from Dan. What do you think is the optimal rest between sets? Does it depend on the exercise? Yes, uh, that is shorter for presses, longer for compound movements like the deadlift. I think the press is a compound movement, but okay. Uh, uh, how about whether or not you're using five sets in a circuit or each exercise? Or is there a different way? Well, to, to look at all this, um, you know, it, if you decide to do those more circuit things or complex things or even every minute on the minute, or even short, like I use 30 rest period, 30 second rest periods a lot. Um, the 30 for 30 for 30 workout, you know, 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off for 30 minutes. When you're talking about rest periods and you're talking about doing a lot of exercises, that's when you're kind of forced, you're, you're trying to get the blood pumping, you're trying to get a sweat going. I know what I'm trying to say. It's going to take me a second to un unpack this. I think complexes, like, that would be, uh, here's the one we use for my throwers. Snatch grip, Romanian deadlifts for eight. Hang snatches for eight. Eight overhead squats. Eight back squats. Put the weight down. Rest. Now, that's eight. So that's 24 reps. Your heart and lungs are... <laughs> you break out in a sweat on the coldest day of the year. Uh, it is... But you can also get weirdly strong doing that. That is how I build my female... Uh, collegiate athletes to get stronger and stronger while we're teaching them the Olympic lifts. You know, when they come in as freshmen, they don't always have a great background in lifting. Uh, some, and that, it's getting much better now, but in the Olympic lifts, not very often. So that gives them a chance to, that gives me two things I can do. First off, I can get their conditioning up. I can give them a lot of reps to improve their Olympic lifting. And as we start to add load as the season goes on, they get stronger and stronger. Uh, on their singles with their snatch and their clean and jerk also. So what am I trying to say? There, there's this weird little area in strength and conditioning where you can use these complex and these circuits to build up true strength. Okay. When you're generally though, complexes, circuit training, those tighter windows or rest periods are to get you sweaty. Ideally, they burn fat, even though I'm... I'm going to suggest that by the end, by a decade from now, we'll be away from the idea that high intensity burns fat. Uh, we'll have moved back to a, a, a more uh, a more balanced approach to what actually incinerates fat. You know, so those tighter rest periods. If you're trying to get your get sweaty, the get sweaty workouts. That's what you want to do for strength. 
It can take up to five minutes to fully recover from a lift. Clean and jerks, as I've mentioned on the podcast before, early in my career, I could clean and jerk the day before a weightlifting meet. Years later, I could total, I could go on a heavy clean and jerk two weeks before a weightlifting meet. Later in my career, the only time I ever did clean and jerks was on the platform because I couldn't recover from the clean and jerk workouts. Now, when you're, <laughs> you know, at the meets, I would open, uh, I mean, I can go kilos or pounds, but I would open the clean and jerk with the, a 363 pound clean and jerk, 165, jump to 175, 385, and then see what I could do from there. Well, I I, when I say that, it boggles my mind now. But I mean, I, I think about the way I used to do those meads and, and do, do those kinds of things. And it would take me, you know, I needed five plus minutes to recover after those lifts. So Dave Turner, I had to figure out ways to get me those that more rest. So if you're trying to get sweaty, keep the, keep the rest periods down. If you're trying to make massive lifts, the rest periods get heavy. All right. So those are the opposites. Those are your, those are your big opposites in the weight room. Okay. My problem with that is this. I'm not resting five minutes between sets. Now, when Barry Ross was working with those elite sprinters back in the day, he would let them rest five minutes per, uh, after every set of deadlifts. But he was also training sprinters. And he was only doing that with the one exercise, the deadlift. So you have to be careful, even inside of a program like Barry Ross's, that when he says five minute rest, he was very specific about which single exercise they rested. But I'll tell you this, heavy deadlifts, I don't know how long, it might take weeks to recover from a really truly massive heavy deadlift uh, for your whole body to feel normal again. So what what we're going to have is it's a very simple formula here dan okay the optimal rest period if you want to get sweaty keep them shorter if you want to get strong let them get longer universally i use three rest periods okay one 30 seconds uh 30 seconds is the rest period actually i use four but we'll get to get to that 30 seconds is the rest period i usually use when i have organized big group training and that just keeps things simple. Uh, we can have one clock on the wall. If it's 12, we start exercising. When it gets to the six, we stop. We start exercising the 12, we stop at the six, 12, six. And it just makes things a lot easier. Uh, everybody knows what to look for. So after the second set, everybody knows when to stop. It's a nice system. The second num- one I use is 60 seconds exactly. Uh, not every minute on the minute, but 60 seconds exactly. And I use that for most of the programs that I'm trying to get people to uh, uh, transform. The transformation program, any kind of want a hormonal impact, you know, I want that it's kind of sweating, uh, one minute. The third is no rest period. And that's what I use with any athlete that's a thrower, uh, any, any kind of explosive uh, Highland game athlete, uh, even Olympic lifter, power lifter, um, and even an American football player, rest when you're re- rest until you're ready. Okay. And those are the big three for me. So the 30 seconds is here. The one minute is that, that it's a hard workout, high reps, clear start point, clear ending point. The third is that you're a big kid you know, when you're ready, be ready, but make the lift. And then the last one I use a lot of is I go, you go. Um, we're going to do uh, armor building complex. I do my two cleans, my one press, my three front squats. I put the weight down. <sighs> you're going. When you put the weight down, I'm going. The first three are very honest uh, answers for you. The 30 seconds for sweaty, the one for physical transformation programs, and the I don't care if you're a strength athlete. And then the I go, you go, especially if I'm working with kettlebells. Uh, Those, I wouldn't say these are perfect answers, but these are the ones that work best for me. And one last thing, Dan, um, I just gave you an honest answer. There's no, I'm not trying to press anyone. There's no BS. Uh, It's, I hope it seemed pretty simple to you. And I hope it was repeatable for everyone listening. So thank you. Okay, so Leowan asks a question. I want to be able to do a (laughs) pull-up. Hey, so do I. Uh, to give you context, I'm 18, six foot tall, and a former rugby player, 
and I'm overweight at the mo at the moment. Hold on, you're you're 18 and a former athlete. You're in the prime of your life, man. I have never been able to do a pull up, and while I can ass access an assisted pull up machine at my gym, it is very rare for me to get to it consistently. So, you have any regressions I could grease the groove with, uh, so to speak, to build up my first pull up? You know, uh, I've actually I've, I've discussed this before on the podcast, but let me tell you how I do it. If you go to uh, danjohnuniversity.com, I have a program called the Hypertrophy and Mobility Program. It was originally called the Post Deployment Program. And basically, I'm going to give you a piece of advice that I think is great. Um, three days a week, I want you to go into the gym. And uh, the, the whole program is in that article, but I uh, <laughs> it's so simple. Okay, so for the first month, three days a week, I want you to go in the gym. On So it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and I'm going to call that day one, day two, day three. On day one, you hang one set. On day two, you do two sets. On day three, you do three sets. And the, on day one, week one, you see, you test how long you can hang. On day two, week one, what you try to do is in two hangs, kind of go. So if you hung, if you hung, hanged, if you hang, whatever the uh, past tense of this word would be, uh, if you if you did that for a minute, you try to add up to more in a minute on the two sets, and on the third workout, you try to add up to more than that first day's test in the three sets and a little extra if you want. Every Monday is a retest of the straight hang. Uh, day two, you try to beat that number in two sets, and day three, you try to beat uh, day one's number in three sets, okay? That's four weeks of that, ideally on week four, day day one, when you test the, the single hang, it'll be better. At the end of that, you then start month two. It does. This doesn't sound like much, folks, but it works really well. This month, it's going to be the flexed arm hang. You know, get your chin up there and hold on as long as you can. Don't be surprised if it's five or 10 seconds. As the month goes on, you try to build up this time here. Now, if you're going to do chin ups, that's fine. Uh, by the way, I find it very easy to hold uh, myself up the bar this way. And I find it very difficult to hold my up myself this way. And I can tell you, even as I do that, where the gap is in my body that needs work. So the third month, by then you've bought uh, my book. You bought my book. Um, this is an attempts. It's also at the danjohnuniversity.com. Uh, I want you to do 30 second hang and one pull up. And I want you to keep doing that until you build yourself up to four in a row. So 30 second hang, one pull up. And I can almost guarantee if you take this seriously, at the end of you know, probably week, let's see, nine, on week nine, you'll be able to do a pull up. Because remember, when you do an isometric hold or hold, your body figures out what to do in between. So that's that's what I usually recommend for people who cannot do a single pull up at all. That's, that's what I recommend. Now, once you want to increase that pull up, then I use the, uh, and it's in a couple of my books, uh, it's the, the fighter pull-up program, um, which I have one of my clients doing right now. Uh, and it's and it's a great little program. But that's for another time, another place. Good question, Dan. Thank you. Daniel. Boy, we're getting a lot of Dan and Daniels in the last few weeks. Uh, Daniel asked a question. You have often discussed the two kettlebell clean and press and said repeatedly you don't like the two kettlebell snatch. What is your stance on the two kettlebell clean and jerk? I, I like the two kettlebell clean and jerk done correctly. Um, Daniel, at the uh, RKC2, uh, I, I teach the movement. We also do several really long, hard workouts with it. Um, anytime you go like this with double kettlebells, I'm fine. I don't like it when you go like this, okay? And that's just my experience, just, just what I've seen. Uh, I don't like it, and I don't think I'm going to start liking it in the future. The two kettlebell clean and jerk, especially if you do it in that I believe it's called the long cycle way, where every single rep is a clean and jerk, clean and jerk, not clean, jerk, 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 but clean and jerk. Watching and listening to people do that at the RKC2 is interesting. 
uh, we, one of the drills we do is that I go, you go um, from the floor, clean, jerk, and then bring it down to the hang, clean, jerk, bring it down, bring it down, put it down, you go. So two clean and jerks. Partner does two clean and jerks. I do two clean and jerks. You do. I go. You go. I go. You go. Uh, it is exhausting. I've had people tell me they they were shocked at how much uh, sweatier, how much harder they breathed doing that than they did doing the armor building complex, which has two cleans, one press, and three front squats. So sometimes those ballistic kettlebell overhead things can be a lot more tiring than you think, which is part of the reason that I don't trust the double kettlebell snatch. Uh, because uh, if you're catching, you're catching a ballistic with, you're catching a ballistic with a flip uh, is just, to me, can be dangerous. And listen, people do them, and that's great. If you get hurt, please don't email me and say, I hurt myself doing something you told me not to do, uh, which I do now. Don't do it in the first place. Wear your seatbelt. <laughs> Wear a helmet. Uh, I, yeah, I like, so I tell you, if you ever want a nasty workout, uh, <laughs> the, that book, Re Return of the Cow Kettlebell, where, where you go, I think the workout is, the, you go two, four, six, then you go four, six, eight, uh, okay, day one, two, four, six, day two, or when you can handle it, uh, four, six, eight, six, eight, ten, eight, ten, twelve. So it's only three sets, but you work yourself up, you know, to like, you know, higher reps than that. I mean, if you got yourself to doing, you know, 16, 18, 20, uh, I think, uh, I think you would qualify as a, being in good shape. Okay. Good question. Kind of fun. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Uh, Manuel asked a question. I really enjoy listening to your weekly podcast. Hope you can keep it going for a long time. Manuel, I would like to do this podcast until someone comes on and says, sadly, Dan John died at age 148 uh, due to complication of a gunshot wound uh, when he suffered being shot by the husband of a supermodel. Terrible story. Uh, I want you to ask you two questions regarding hill sprints. Hill sprints and sleds seem to put your lower body in a similar position. Uh, backwards and forwards, are they just two ways to load the same pattern? Okay, the answer I think is yes, but I still think hill sprints are better. And the only reason I say that, and that's just from my experience, is that a lot of sleds will fishtail. Um, a good friend of mine got hurt. Some person came up with this idea of dragging sleds up. Uh, they, they did this contest where they, they did a one mile uphill sled pull. Uh, he got it caught on a bramble or a bush and it, tagged him. He got pulled down and got hurt. Uh, you know, he got caught backwards, you know, like someone grabbing your collar. Um, cause they fishtail as they move. Um, and I do think you can get a little bit more forward lean in the hill sprint versus the sled pull. Um, by the way, folks quit overloading the sleds. Uh, I, d I can't give you a number, but I think a lot of people are really starting to take it's, it's not supposed to be a grind. It should be snapping explosive. The upside of a, of a sled, I do think is in walking backward. Uh, I do walk backwards up the, up our, our hill over here a lot. And I think it's great for my knees, but I do think the one nice thing about the uh, backward sled pull, sled walk for the knees is that you can regulate it so much better with load. Uh, when I do the backward hill, I wear my vest sometimes. Uh, I used to take off my vest and then I started noticing I got nothing out of it. So I started wearing my vest, progressive resistance exercises. And instantly I noticed uh, my um, those horseshoe muscles around the knees working harder. So if there is an advantage, I would say forward, it's the hill sprint, backwards, it's the sled, but it doesn't matter. Both are marvelous. Okay, two, I want to get started in hill sprints. How would you recommend me to start? Well, I would get to a hill and then run up it. He goes on, of course, finding a proper hill is first, but what duration, intensity, frequency, progression, etc., do you use for beginners? 
uh, I would recommend this if you can. Don't be an old crazy coach from some bad movie. Um, start off with two hill sprints, you know. Uh, anything more than, it's there, there, there's a number out there, but six or seven seconds. After that, I don't know if you get much out of it. I've done hills that were too big. The school I used to coach at, at Judge, has a perfect hill inside the football stadium. But we'd use the outdoor one, the, the outside of the school one sometimes, and it was just too big. So you sprint, and all of a sudden, all you're doing is going lumber, lumber. I'm sure there's value to uh, 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 but you lose the benefits. So for me, think the first day to figure out, you know, you know, maybe even try it yourself, figure out a spot to get, you get, you get to a certain spot at five, six, seven, eight seconds, you know, something that's clear, definable, and make that the mark. Uh, one nice thing about hill sprints is when you stop, you stop. There's no slowdown, really. Um, physics, gravity. <laughs> but uh, that's my recommendation. It's better to go shorter and more than it is to go longer and just worthless. Uh, and you'll once you do a few of them, man, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. It becomes... Uh, self as self evident as uh, Thomas Jefferson would say good good question Pedro says I am currently a rugby player in Spain at an amateur level I was wondering if substituting the Olympic lifts for power curls and high pulls could be a good idea to get similar power ben power benefits if possible I would want to know your opinion and what do you think about those exercises um so Pedro those are those are exercises that I'd heard about in my youth and since I was an Olympic lifter, didn't do them. But I would say I do have some regrets on not. So when I started doing power curls, and it's a foundation exercise in the uh, um, transformation program, as you know, um, I, I really started getting the benefits of power curls within days. I mean, it was a marvelous exercise for me. Uh, of course, the great... Uh, four-time Olympic gold medals, Al Order, um, used them a ton in his career, <laughs> a ton. Um, and I do think, it, some of you would call it a cheating curl, uh, but I think they're great exercises. Uh, my good friend, the, the great shot putter, Pizza Steve, of course, he told me, I asked him a secret one time, and he said, well, you're not gonna like it. And I went, oh God, and, you know, it's gonna be something, something I should report to the police or something, you know? And he goes, yeah, I stopped doing snatches and cleans and just went to snatch pulls and clean pulls because it was so much easier on my wrist and I felt like I could recover faster and throw farther. I went, ah, that's such a piece of genius advice. So yeah, I think so. Um, the one nice thing I'm, I'm gonna tell you too, Pedro, about the both the pulls and the uh, power curls is you don't have to get stuck in that two, three, five range uh, for reps. Um, if you get a chance to do pulls up in the eights, uh, power curls and snatch pulls and clean pulls in the eight range, uh, you'll find muscles you didn't know you had. And you really do feel like, uh, you do feel pretty athletic doing them. I uh, hope that helped and uh, let me know how it goes. Thank you. Okay, I've got a question from Matt. My question is not about training, but about college football. I'm from the lovely historic city of York, I love York, Matt. I, oh, so folks, those of you, especially from America, what you think England looks like is York. York is a beautiful town. And I started following the NFL around 11 years ago. I chose to follow the Seattle Seahawks. Oh, too bad you didn't follow a good team. Oh, snap. Um, this was for the reasons of it raining all the time, so it felt more English, and the fact that I'm a big fan of so many Seattle bands. I would like to know if there are any college football programs you admire other than your assumed alma mater bias. Uh, you mean the Utah State University? Um, I have no context for knowing who I would root for and would be really interested to know if you have any insights into specific college culture or even insider knowledge of an interesting or robust strength program that could help me pick, pick a team to follow. Uh, just curious to know your thoughts. Thank you. And I love this following part here, folks. Listen to this. Matt says this. He goes, P.S. If you chose to answer this 
podcast. Please, could you say hello to my brother, Josh? There is a very high likelihood that we will both be listening to this at work at the same time, and I could wave to him from my tractor. Uh, Josh, hello. It is You have a brother who's very interesting. I understand you're a wonderful human person, and uh, I expect a picture of the two of you from the streets of York. There's this great street in York that kind of leads right into that great uh, the cathedral, the west, the cathedral that's there in town. Um, I want a picture of you two there. Josh, I, I hope you're having a good day. And please wave to your brother who's on a tractor at this point. So, yeah, my uh, my go-to teams in the United States to cheer for. Um, so Utah State would be, you know, that's my alma mater. Very proud of the school. Uh, I have followed the University of Utah because my daughter went there. And she was a hammer thrower there. And that's where she met Thomas. And my uh, son-in-law goes there, uh, went there, and yeah, it's 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 a really school, and it's right near me, and I, um, and I I know a lot of the coaches up there, so that's nice. Uh, my favorite teams to watch uh, college football are generally the uh, the three academy schools. That would be Army, Navy, and Air Force. Though I do like our friends over at the Coast Guard Academy, and a hats off to our friends at at Kings Point, the Merchant Marine Academy. Uh, I like the, uh, I've always followed the academies because I've always felt like they reflect, their issues reflect the, the athletes I work for. Every school I've ever worked at has high academic standards. Now, that's going to sound weird to somebody from another country, but not every school, not every university is um, <laughs> an academic bastion. Some of them are kind of party schools, shockingly, I know. But so Army, Navy, and Air Force are always fun to watch. Um, if you get a chance to read uh, John Feinstein's book, A Civil War, um, probably seven or eight people in the book are personal friends of mine, which makes me very happy. But it's about the 1996 Army, Navy football game. And it was, it was a, it's a great book, just a great book. Interesting, a lot of those uh, players are now either generals and admirals or on the threshold of being generals and admirals, which is kind of interesting. Um, uh, from there, yeah, I mean, there are certain schools I'll cheer for. I mean, I, I got great respect for the Alabama coach, Nick Saban, though, you know, frankly, I, you know, a lot of people can't stand him and, you know, be it what is may. Uh, I tend to cheer for Oregon a lot, uh, because it's a great track school, but, um, boy, other schools I would, uh, you know, they're, that's oh, tough. Uh, sometimes I'll, wa I, I watch any game I can get. Uh, I do love the game. Um, the thing a lot of Europeans wouldn't know is that the smaller division is even more fun. That's, that's the division that has South Dakota State, North Dakota State, uh, Carroll College, uh, um, oh, what's the school? It's got Mary somebody. It's a Texas school. It's real good. But it's the, it's the smaller division, uh, Montana, Montana State. And they play a true national champion. It's not a miscongeniality like uh, what we have in the biggest. Uh, there's no way teams like Alabama want to have a true playoff because they would have to travel. Alabama would have to some year have to go to Southern California and play a game. And they'd have to be on a plane for more than an hour. And they don't want to play. A lot of these SEC school, C schools, uh, I'd love to see... Uh, like a uh, Florida play uh, up in December in Michigan. I, I, that'd be a fun game to watch. Yeah, so I'm a big fan. And Mike, Matt, thanks for asking. It's it it means a lot. And everybody, just remember Matt and Josh uh, as they wave at each other from their tractors. Okay, thank you. Okay, this is an interesting question, and it's funny because uh, I got a little note from my friend Ozzy. He says these are one of those questions we that don't get a lot of play, but the people who do follow up really care about them. So here you go. All right, Jeff says this. I'm wondering if you could put your philosopher or theologian hat and offer two or three tips for pursuing fitness virtuously. What value does training add to a life that is primarily seeking to be virtuous? It seems 19 out of 20 online fitness professionals would have us to become worse people, self-hating, vain, arrogant, obsessed, Prideful, anxious, selfish, self-centered, spiteful, etc. in order to get healthier. Any thoughts? Yeah, well, remember, uh, what a lot of people 
mistake sometimes, and I'm not teaching or coaching right now, but values are a thing you value. And I like to spend time with my clients uh, going through what they value in life. And see, and the reason I, okay, my two values, and I did the whole assignment, and my two key values are order and fitness. It's weird. I mean, obviously it's fitness because, I mean, that's been my my go-to since 1965 and order is something that I've only realized in the last few years, how important it is to me. So those are the things I value. And there's obviously others. And I mean, obviously things that'll make, you know, yay, but virtues, a virtuous life is a, a life that you must practice. So, so this is something people miss is that you're going to be, you, you know, you can't always be, uh, courage is a virtue. Okay. And it sits in the middle between foolhardy and cowardice. Well, what you want to be as a, in a courageous person is you want to do things that are courageous. And sometimes, sometimes honestly, just going to work on time is the greatest act of courage you can possibly have. So, but we don't want you to, you know, I mean, if you say, Dan, swing off this rope, I'm going to look first to see what I'm swinging into. It doesn't mean I'm a coward. It means that I'm not foolhardy. So I'm not a coward and I'm not foolhardy somewhere in the middle. And after I look, I say, okay, but why am I doing this? Oh, because it's fun. Okay, I got it. See ya. Wee. Um, the best ways to pursue fitness virtuously to me would be this. Don't cut corners. Don't cut corners. You know, don't, uh, don't take drugs when food's the answer. Uh, don't take supplements when sleep's the answer. Um, don't drink a bunch of hooey when water is the answer. Um, you know, don't, don't cheat. <laughs> don't, don't, don't cheat. I mean, don't, you know, every so often I'll, I'll post something and some, some person, I had a lot of other words, uh, to say right there, will post like, you know, just take a bunch of, you know, and they'll just list a bunch of drugs and be like, yeah, do that. But here's the thing. Take all the drugs you want. Just don't be a bitch on your deathbed, okay? You know, I, that's the thing that drives me most crazy about the druggers I've known, is when they get someone when they get close to the end, they they just they start. I don't want to hear about your regrets. So I guess that would be a better way to say it, and that was rude the way I said it, but it was true. Is try to uh, chase, pursue, uh, pursue, quarry, quarry your, pursue your fitness goals without regrets, you know, um, don't look for shortcuts, you know, and in fact, you're going to find out and everyone's going to, everybody finds out sooner or later that the long route was the shortcut. I mean, I know it's, I know it's a cliche and I know I use it a lot, but it is true. The long route is the shortcut. So that would be the number one thing I would say, Jeff, is make a decision that you're going to do things the right way. And you know what the right way is. The right way is drinking enough water the right way is, you know, sleeping nine hours a night, uh, meditating, uh, taking a nap when appropriate, read great books, be a good neighbor, be a good parent, family member, community member. Uh, you know, if you're going to be, uh, you know, banging on your chest about what a great person you are, but you don't, don't put your weights back. Well, you know, the, the, you know, I, I, you know, I see this in gyms all the time. People come in and they do all this stuff. And they leave a terrible mess behind them. Dan Martin always says the the best warm up in any gym in America is just put all the weights away where they belong. And in fact, that's probably the best workout you can ever do. Um, so first off, no regrets. Okay, do it do it in a mindful, appropriate way without cutting corners. That's a one, isn't it? That's number one. But there's a lot of parts to number one. Second is if you can do this is try to remember the Western civilization ideals. Your, your mind, your body, your soul, your spirit are all one. So as you go on this journey, um, what lessons in the weight room are you learning about life that will help you with your children? What lessons with your children will help you with your fitness? Um, it was very nice to uh, talk to my daughter not long ago. She was talking about her son and how he eats. And they don't have any junk food for them. No, no junk food. Uh, 
Not a lot of treats. Of course, you know, at certain events and there's treats, he loses his mind because he's a little kid. But they, you know, they, they, they're vegetable first. They're water. They're, um, there's a phrase they use. My kid is bougie. And, and, I, and I know what, that I don't think that's what bourgeois means, but I get it. Okay. But, uh, you know, if, if you worry about, if you worry about what your children are eating, you're probably a little bit more tuned in to what you are eating. Um, the best walk you can take every night is to grab one of your children's hands and take your kid for a walk, find out what's going on in their life. You know, uh, it's a great way to get your exercise in, you know, it's almost as good as a dog, you know, uh, except you're, you have to fight with your kids a lot more to get them out the door the first time. <sighs> Those are probably my big two, um, is to, you know, don't look for shortcuts, do it the right way, you know, be good. And the second is try to incorporate everything you incorporate in your fitness part of your life. Those lessons should dive back in the rest of your life. Those lessons you get in the rest of your life should dive back into your uh, fitness life. And pretty soon you should be in a place that your, your fitness goals, your financial goals, your emotional goals, your social goals are all vaguely in the same little pot. And that's what I strive for. I hope that helped. That's an interesting question, Jeff. Thank you. Rob asks a very interesting question, and it's our last question. If you were going to be a Peace Corps volunteer and could only bring two check bags for two years to a developing country, including clothes, personal items, etc., what fitness strength gear would you bring? Um, first off, uh, when I travel, I never travel with more than two bags. In fact, I carry with an extreme, exceedingly small travel uh, uh bag and then I have a a, a backpack on, uh, that I got from Parker University. Um, I have a packing checklist that I use all the time. Um, so I've actually already answered this question for myself. Uh, let me give you three things, three concrete things that I always travel with. But one of the other things you have to realize that when you when you're on when you're doing something that like this, Depending on what your your path is with the core, um, you're going to be, you know, you might be spending a lot of time in the fields, or spending a lot of time doing work all day. So your fitness needs are going to change a little bit. So the three pieces of equipment I always travel with are, da da da. First off, I always travel with a Brett Contreras glute loop. I put it just above my knees, and I do hip thrusts and I do clamshells each and every morning when I'm on the road, because I think that's the best way to counter all the flying and sitting I do when I travel. Uh, and I, I tell you, it 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 busts you up. Uh, you know, flying, you know, overnight to Europe, you know, getting to the hotel, getting a rough night's sleep, waking up in the morning and having to go 12 hours at a, at a, at a certification. That's hard on my body, honestly. And those hip thrusts and clamshells really uh, do a good job. The other thing about a hip thrust, uh, that they're they're sturdy enough that you can stick your arms in them. So, and you can, again, I would say in this case, put them not over your elbows, but under your elbows here. Oh, sorry about that. Is when you're doing push-ups, you can get a little bit of a squeeze out. You're gonna have to kind of practice that for your own, what you find is the best location but you can do kind of a glute loop push-up with those. Now, is this hip thrust, clamshell, push-up, is that enough to keep you going? I don't know. I also add a very simple exercise after I finish them for my ab wall. Um, I call them push and curl. So just, I'll do my best to explain, but I lay on my back and my feet are on the ground. So my knees are bent, okay? Uh, my knees are up. I don't know how to explain that. And I push my lower back into the ground as hard as I can. And I try to have full, you know, full hard push that activates the eight pack, six pack. And then all I do is this with my neck, I burrito it up until I really feel the ab wall contract. Um, push the back, curl the neck uh, for abs. That's not bad. So I gave you four exercises that and the glute loop weighs practically nothing. The second piece of equipment is a, a mini band. Now the mini band might not last two years though, especially with the weather's rough. 
But the nice thing about a, a mini band is that you can, I put around the socks and then I, well, the, I think the best way to train now, Mike Warren Brown will disagree with me, but he's wrong. Uh, Mike likes to do where well, you keep one foot, you keep one foot in place and then you step away with the other foot. I like to just take, put them around my socks and I like to walk like this. Then I like to walk sideways, sideways, and then backwards. Uh, turn the toes out, turn the toes in, and just wait until you feel your glutes on absolute, absolute, absolute fire. The third piece of equipment, and by the way, so what we're looking at now is almost nothing in your bag. I always have them, but uh, I always travel with a a small cloth. Um, you get these at a sewing store, but there's these small little measuring tapes about this big, and then whoosh, and I would recommend measuring your waistline and maybe one or two other things uh at least weekly daily is fine but I, a weekly probably be enough measure your waistline and then pick one or two other spots in your body uh, you can measure one of your arms your, your your pythons uh maybe a thigh the only problem with a thigh is it's hard to remember we measured it last time and i know everyone in the world you know internet world always does things perfectly but I don't but fine so find a waistline an arm a thigh or calf and if your waistline is going uh, uh you know if your waistline is shrinking while you're on this trip uh, that's great but if your your thighs and arms are also shrinking you know some other stuff might be going on uh, my friends when they came back from the Peace Corps were often much leaner than when they left Weirdly, those who went off to the Marine Corps are the same. So I guess it's the core diet, huh? Go. But those would be the three pieces I would take. And the total amount of room they they have in, in your bag is practically nothing. Uh, I have a roller bag, and the roller bag has these two things that hold the, you know, the, the handle, the, 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 the carrying handle. And so the glute loop, the main band, and this all fit right there, and then, you know, that's usually also where I'll stack up like my underwear. So it's underneath my underwear, but in an underwear, in a bag. So it stacks right on top of it like this. And then, and then I have a flat surface for everything else. So mini band, glute loop, measuring tape. Uh, and realize that you probably after two years will not be carrying those things home. Okay. Um, let me take, uh, thank you, Rob. That was a good question. Well, that's it. Well, thank you so much. These were fun questions today. Um, I like that. Uh, as always, if you have questions, you're going to send them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. I sit down here each and every week, uh, happy to answer them. Remember, this podcast is a question and answer podcast. So your questions are what I answer. Let me know how I can help. And until next time, let's all keep on lifting and learning.